Good morning. It's great to be here with you again. I see a lot of familiar faces, and it's uh, always uh, wonderful to be on the other side. <laughs> so I would like to thank General Ham and uh, General Swang and overall AUSA for the opportunity to share some uh, my perspective on contracting, acquisition, prototypes, readiness with you. When I was in the Pentagon, I gave an analogy of the laborious uh, acquisition process and compared it to an acquisition bus, which some of you guys have heard. Namely, the PM was a bus driver and every single stakeholder on, is a passenger on this very long bus. And every single one of the stakeholder has a steering wheel and a brake. Right? So that was my description of how acquisition was, uh, long and laborious. In our desire for speed, we need to be mindful of not changing this bus into a scenario which now all the stakeholders now possess steering wheel and accelerator pedals okay, because neither scenario produces a good result. Okay. The need to keep pace with rapidly advancing threats dictates that our acquisition weapon system must move faster. Section 804 of the NDAA language enabled the DOD to leverage rapid acquisition and contracting mechanism to move faster. Uh, other transaction authority, or OTAs, are not covered by the cumbersome federal acquisition regulations. So, not surprisingly, OTA is now the favored contracting method du jour. Right? The intent of the OTA is to encourage small businesses and non-traditional contractors to provide their innovation to the DOD. The obvious question to the Army Contracting Command is how well have we done that in the last three years uh, in terms of accomplishing that goal? Okay. What metrics have we established to look at our OTA awards? OTA stipulates that if the awardee is a traditional defense contractor, one-third cost share is required. This scenario potentially sets up some unintended consequences. Okay. For traditional defense contractors, I call it the pay-to-play strategy that the Army is utilizing requires the company to provide significant upfront uh, investment to develop a prototype okay, and bring it to the Army to test. Industry has to consider if there's a return on their investment. They cannot invest at that level in every opportunity that opens up. You will end up driving consolidation in the defense industry. This is already being played out last year. Harris with L3, SAIC went with Angelity, Raytheon currently with United Technologies. In addition, it is a far more difficult for small companies to play due to the upfront investment that's required to develop a prototype. So you may inadvertently reduce competition due to this strategy. A prototype does not equal production ready. It is a proof of design. Without the details of the illities that's designed in, namely the repairability, the reliability, the testability, the maintainability, sustainability, or manufacturability are typically not considered in the prototype phase. Once the proof of design is demonstrated, an iteration of the design is design phase is actually required to implement all the illities. Building a prototype is the easy part. Okay? The hard part is to design a high performance weapon system that's reliable, easily manufacturable, that's maintainable, easily repairable and sustainable, all an affordable cost. Just demonstrating a prototype does not imply it is production ready. Okay. 
Industry is looking for opportunities to turn rapid prototype activities into a program of record that generates production quantities, since that's the way that they can recoup their investment. So I would encourage the Army to think about the linkage and the plan for the smooth transition from rapid prototyping to a program of record. Okay. If you want to accelerate schedule, you need to understand the trade-offs. How mature is the technology? What are the development risks and integration risks? What are the supplier risks? What corners are being cut to meet the accelerated schedule? What are the impacts? What are the gaps and limitations between prototype and a production-ready design? Rapid technology refresh is profitable in the commercial industry due to the vastly larger quantities that's sold commercially. This does not translate well to the Army, since procurement quantities are far smaller. Small quantity buys pose a challenge for industry in trying to recoup their investment. And just remember, if a product is commercially available, that means everyone can get access to the same thing, not just the U.S. Army. The question you will have to ask is, how does that normalize capabilities between us and our adversaries? Okay. If you use commercial off-the-shelf products, be aware that the commercial industry evolves very rapidly. They don't necessarily worry about backward compatibility for decades. Right? So the issues that the Army has to address are parts obsolescence, training in a diverse set of equipment, sustainment of an ever-growing set of spares, licensing as well as cyber assurance, and certification of your software. Okay. So my biggest concern is that when the budget goes down, that's only a matter of time, okay, that one, we're left with a bunch of prototypes but nothing in inventory, and a bunch of legacy systems without upgrades. And two, when the prototypes finally turn into production-ready weapon systems, how can the Army afford so many big-ticket procurement bills simultaneously? Okay. So how are we going to modernize, be ready, and prepare for the next conflict? Here's a few thoughts. Our weapon systems are increasingly dependent on vast amount of software. Software assurance becomes ever more critical to ensure that our systems are safe and secure from malicious actors. Our weapon systems are overly reliant on GPS. We need to rapidly develop, test, and implement assured PNT to reduce our dependence on GPS. We need to leverage AI and machine learning to reduce the amount of data that we're collecting into a manageable set of informed courses of action. At the same time, we need to understand the limitations of AI. Okay. Is our architecture truly open to enable rapid insertion of software upgrades and hardware upgrades. We need layered defense so that we're not dependent on a single solution, but a diversity of toolkit to address evolving threats. To shorten weapon system development to production cycle time, we can leverage design by using known established manufacturing processes. We have a tremendous opportunity to rethink sustainment and logistics in light of rapidly advancing additive manufacturing capabilities. It should dramatically reduce our parts warehouse footprint, okay, as well as our sustainment and logistics cost. We need to flip 
the paradigm that design is 30% of the cost and sustainment is 70% of the cost. Okay. We should not test a single weapon system in isolation and be satisfied, but test the entire system of system under a contested environment that we will be fighting in. Okay. We need to implement continuous training not just an exercise at set rotations. We need to leverage rapid advancement of augmented reality in conjunction with live virtual and constructive simulation. We need to measure ourselves every step of the contracting process and share best practices in contracting to reduce our cycle time. To enable speed in weapons development and deployment, we need strong collaboration across organizations to ensure rapid prototype development, smooth transitioning into a programmer record to finish the prototype design for producibility, and leverage additive manufacturing to transform our sustainment and logistics enterprise. To encourage collaboration, I'm a strong advocate of setting performance evaluation on the level of collaboration. Thank you. I'm happy to take a few questions, time permitting. Ma'am, thank you for being here. I'll kick things off. Uh, what were some of your biggest challenges in your former role as the Assistant Secretary of the Army? for acquisition. That, that will require the rest of the afternoon. <laughs> <laughs> I would say the biggest challenge I faced from walking into the Army with zero background in Army was the huge proliferation of acronyms and trying to understand what the heck is this language you're talking about. Okay, so that was a, a very big challenge. And second piece is to, to understand the Army is far, far bigger than the Air Force and the Navy. And the equipment, the fact that there's 12 PEOs and just, you know, mind-boggling amount, number of programming equipment that they require. So it was uh, a real adjustment to try to understand the needs of the various entities and try to figure out how to establish best practices. Good morning, ma'am. Speaking of 12 PEOs, hey, the, um, <laughs> good it's you. good to see you again. One of the questions is, as I listen, and, and I agree with the, your statements, is about segmenting the market. And, and what I mean by that is mm -hmm. I, I'm not necessarily sure that one size fits all in the discussion of how we do prototyping, you know, how we do kind of government-owned architectures, and, and take it from uh, commodity-based type systems all the way to the major weapons platforms. And, and so I'm just asking where you see the differences, uh, you know, kind of the breakover point, where we should, you know, prototyping, uh, maybe it's cheap and simple in some places and maybe it's not in others. And kind of how we evaluate that across the marketplace uh, and our industry partners. That, so it really depends on what you are leveraging in the prototypes in terms of uh, commercially off the shelf equipment, right? If you're using COTS, you're really leveraging an existing market. If you're designing a unique weapon system for the Army, it's a little different from just buying components or parts that's mature. Okay? Designing a weapon system and building a prototype, I can tell you, having been an engineer growing up in the engineering world, designing, developing systems, and fielding it, and being a program manager, and being a business manager, I understand how far a prototype is from production-ready design, okay? Because you don't think about, well, it, have I hit the 98% reliability on the prototype design? Because all you're trying to do is prove that this design works, right? Once it works, then you can tweak the design for all the illities. What I worry about is because there's such a huge thrust on doing just prototypes, you're not thinking through 
what is the next step to get her to the point that a soldier will want to end up using it. It has to be reliable. You don't want something that works 50% of the time. That's not acceptable, right? You depend upon your weapon system to work when you need it, okay? So there's a huge gap between a prototype and a program or record that's production ready, ready to transition into production, okay? And I worry because I don't hear about that aspect being talked about, and that's a that's a big step, okay? So I would say for unique weapon systems that you can't just buy off the shelf like an iPhone, okay, pay attention to the illities because that is ultimately important for the soldier. Okay. Ma'am, I found our good friend Sydney Freeberg who has a question. <laughs> Sydney, you're hiding. <laughs> yeah, I made the wrong turn uh, in, and in North Virginia that's another 15 minutes of going in circles uh, but I, I, ma I made it here for, for you which I'm glad let me ask I mean drawing out the implications of something you've said and this is not I think a worry that's unique to you uh, that basically with the big six the 31 signature programs etc we will end up in the army with a lot of awesome prototypes that we can't actually afford to buy any of in bulk. I mean, you know, how, you know, if you're a betting woman, what's, you know, what's, what are the odds of ending up in that situation and what are the best things we can do to avoid it? And, you know, including, you know, some probably some painful trade-offs in terms of which of those 31 things we may actually get when or at all. Yeah, so you're absolutely right. That's exactly what I'm worried about because all of them kind of mature around the same time, and then the Army is not going to get the entire DOD bill, right, the budget. There's no way. So therefore, some of the priority is going to fall off the table because you have no procurement money, okay? So it comes down to what is the most important uh, to the Army at that time when you've built a prototype and demonstrate some of the capability. You've got to prioritize your top 31 choices because you can't have them all. It's like going to the buffet table and you have 31 courses. Well, good luck, you can't eat it all, <laughs> okay? So what's your most favorite? What's your most urgent piece that you need? Is it the lethality piece? And then it's the missiles, okay? Uh, is, it, is it going to be the next scout replacement because we've tried to rebirth this numerous times, right? Or is it going to be an unmanned system that we're going to focus on in the future? Because if you think about it, the Israeli army is already testing autonomous unmanned systems with robotics. You're taking the soldier out of the danger zone, right? The robots are going to sacrifice their lives for you. So have we thought about that construct? Are the weapon systems that we're buying and developing prototypes today going to be obsolete by the time we need them, right? We may need them today, but the war changes very rapidly and technology is advancing very rapidly, okay? So that's my biggest concern. We're still focusing on manned platforms, combat vehicles, because that's what we grew up with, but the war in the future may not be that. Ma'am, we have one last question, and that is, what are your thoughts on commercial open source software and DOD use versus lockdown DOD-focused architecture? So my biggest concern is you can certainly buy commercial off-the-shelf uh, software, uh, but the security aspect is what we worry about, right? Is, is, did somebody plant a malicious bug in there just when you need it it is not going to work or it's going to give you a false answer a deceptive answer a commander has to have a trusted system right you can't say well you know i bought it off the shelf so therefore it must work it may work today but when you're in a battle is it going to work so therefore, that's the aspect we have to think through. What are the vulnerabilities that's inherent in the software, in the open architecture that we have laid out? Okay, 
because cyber will just continue to escalate. It's not going to get easier. I'll be here all day, so if you want to catch me during a break, I'll be happy to answer more questions. Thank you very much.